Today, I'm going to take you on a road trip to Echo Mountain Recording Studios in Asheville, North Carolina, where I recorded a rock band. I'm going to show you the microphones, the setup, the gear I used, and how it sounded. Check it out. Alrighty, well, I'm driving up to Asheville and to Echo Mountain to work with the Hooplas. This band, it's a rock band. Echo Mountain is an amazing studio, and I've worked there before. I did a big chunk of the String Dusters Silver Sky album there. It's an amazing place. It's in a church. It's right in downtown Asheville. Great place. You can just walk outside, and go to a bar, go get something to eat. Well, here I am pulling up to the studio. First thing I needed to do was go in there and meet the team, which I've actually never met before. That's a whole other story. On guitar is Cody Bush. So this is Vocals and guitar is Adam Martin. Yeah, yeah, Bass guitar yeah, yeah. is Ben Martin. And on drums, the incredible Alex Abraham. We've also got Kenny Harrington, who is an Echo Mountain engineer, and he did a great job. Awesome. First thing we started doing was setting up the drums. And that's really the main reason to be at a studio like this for the gear and the room for the drums. We ended up switching out some of the drums later on. And you'll see that later I added some gobos to the left and right to cut down on some of the room sound that was actually getting into the overheads. Most of the microphones for the drums, guitar, and bass, and vocals were run through this 32-channel Neve 8068, which was built in the early 70s. Legend has it that Dave Grohl wanted to buy this console, but it took him an extra week getting the money together, and the owner of the studio was able to get in there and buy it before Dave Grohl could get it. Each channel has a low and high pass filter, a low shelving EQ that will boost or cut 220 hertz, 110 hertz, or 60 hertz, a parametric EQ for the middle, and you can see there's a bunch of frequencies there, and a high-end shelf EQ that will boost or cut 10, 12, or 16K. Up here at the top, you've got the gain knob, which really does a lot to change the character of the sound. You can really make it sound kind of crunchy and edgy when you turn it up, or you can turn it down and just give it a nice, smooth, silky sound. On the kick drum, I had a AKG D112 on the inside, one of these. And then you can see I had a Neumann U87 on the outside to pick up more of an air sound, which I ended up not using. But if you look here, they've got their own homemade sub-kick mic, which is basically a Yamaha NS10M speaker hung on a stand. And you can make that into a microphone because a dynamic mic is basically a speaker backwards. But the reason I like theirs is because I think it's a better sound than this right here, which I'm sure you've seen before, which is a more marketed, nice looking version of the same thing. I don't think those sound so good because I think that shell actually kind of muffles the sound. I made my own years ago. This is something I made like probably in the early 90s. And this is how people used to do it. They would usually put it on a mic stand. I'm actually hanging mine here on a guitar stand hung with bass strings and um, just wired it up, and I've used this on a million records, never changed a thing on it, and I think this sounds way better than the store-bought ones. Theirs sounded amazing. Let me show you what it sounded like. Here's the drums. All right, I'm gonna turn off the sub-kick mic here. Oh, and by the way, you're gonna need to be listening to this on some big speakers or really good headphones or earbuds. Let me turn it back on. Now here's the inside kick mic by itself. I'm gonna add the sub kick mic. See how it brings that in there? Now here's the sub kick mic by itself. It, it does something, man. It's like adds a lot of nice woofy low end and it's a great tool. I had a Shure SM57 on the snare drum, which I ran into a distressor compressor, just hitting it just a teeny bit with an AKG 414 on the bottom side to capture the snares. I used Sennheiser 421s on each tom. On the hi-hat, I had a Shure SM7, which might seem a little unusual, but I actually think it helps smooth out the hi-hats. And then I also had a Shure SM57 on the ride cymbal as just a little spot mic. It's not something 
that's got a lot of high end on it, like a small diaphragm condenser, but it actually is more directional and the main frequencies on the ride cymbal are usually more upper mid range than super high end anyway. On the overheads, I used a pair of vintage AKG C12s and I ran those into a smart stereo compressor. One of my little tricks is to take an AKG 414 and place it straight over the snare drum, anywhere from six to eight feet, overdrive it through the mic pre and distort it a little bit, and then I get it off the snare drum. I'm gonna show you how it works, but first, this is what the mic actually sounds like right here. That's the distorted mic right there. And what I do is I, on the regular snare drum, I do a bus send out, pre-fader, and I do that so that no matter where this volume is at, it doesn't change the send volume. It's always going to get the same volume. That signal is going into a gate plugin I have here on the distorted mic. So I've got the side chain turned on here. If you want to listen to the source, this is what it's hearing. Just the snare drum. And I'm not completely gating it. I'm only bringing it down, what, right here I've got it uh, negative 19.2, right? Now when you blend that in with the mix, there it is with it. Here it is without it. Back in. Out. And sometimes when you're doing that, it, it depending on the pitch and a bunch of other factors, sometimes it'll just make the snare drum sound really fat. And thicker and you can do so many things with it, but it's something I do on almost every single drum kit that I might. If you're interested in going into more detail about using gates on drums, go to my video, Mixing Drums Part 1, Using Gates. I'll put a link down in the description. As I said before, one of the reasons to come to a studio like this is to capture the sound of the drums in a large, cool room using a pair of Cole's 3048 ribbon mics great Neve mic pre's and these amazing compressors here which I slammed the room mics through. Check this out. Here's the drums with the distorted mic on it. No room mics, just the close mics and the overheads. Now I'm going to bring in these room mics. Huge, right? Here they are by themselves. Awesome sounding. Now, I'm not sure if I really like that kick drum so much in the room mics, so what I did is I put a gate on the room mics like I did on the overhead distorted mic and triggering it off the uh, snare drum again. So now the room mics mostly pop in when the snare hits, but it's still in there a little bit when the kick is hitting because I've only got it down 12 dB. Actually, I'm going to bring it up just a little bit. So there it is with the gate on it just a little bit. Now without it. Now back on. And then off. No room mics. Let me tell you, it's all about the room mics. Day two, Echo Mountain with the hooplas. This is the back side. So we're coming in from the rear. Yeah, you can see the windows of the church up there. There's Cody yeah. getting ready for the day. It's like the lounge hangout area, pool table, piano, some games, a nice kitchen over here. So they just bought a bunch of groceries because we're going to be here for days. So it looks like people are going to be doing some cooking in here. They've got, it's like their tech room, but extra gear. Then up the stairs, there's Adam. Rock on, Billy. Another little lounge up here. A secret door that I don't know where the secret door goes. Now over here, I got a little B room back here. It's like you could do some vocals in here and stuff and editing, overdub suite. We're actually not using this, but just thought I'd show it. It's pretty cool. Then in here, got the uh, church control room. Got the Sneeve console. Got some Adams monitors, some Yamahas, some Ospergers, then a whole rack full of gear here. You know, we might have plugins for it, but this is the real stuff. We've got a Fairchild 
670 down there. Really awesome setup. And here we've got the uh, machine room. We got a 24 track machine, bunch of different converters. Look at that computer. Holy mother. Oh yeah, check this out. Tape echo. And here, there is another overdub room right now. We've got the bass amp set up in here, but they've got like, they got some cool stuff in here. They got one of these old Ampeg bass amps and there's another Ampeg. This cool high watt amp back here. And then in here, got the main room. So we got the drum set up. Hey man, you're ruining my shot. No, I'm okay. <laughs> Stop yelling at me. <laughs> this room, I recorded a String Dusters album here called Silver Sky, but man, this room's really cool for drums. Let me take it from this direction here. So there's the control room back over there. I put these gobos up because I was getting a little too much room sound on the overheads. We've got extra drums, just in case we want to switch any of those out. And then back here, We've got a little amp closet where we've got Adam's amp here. And then in here, we got Cody's rig. Now, actually, Cody normally uses software amps, but we're trying this Mesa Boogie Combo amp. They've also got, this is a prototype Marshall amplifier that's literally the only one in existence. Yeah, they got a lot of stuff in here. Another Leslie cab. Look at these things. And then here, now this is a door with just some glass on it so that Adam can stand in there and sing and see everybody. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> this is where Adam's hanging out. We're using an Elam 251. But yeah, this is his vantage point right here. You can stand here and see everybody. That's it. <laughs> Even though on sessions like these, the main purpose is to capture the drums, I make everybody play together because they're a band. They need to be vibing, they need to be as close together as possible and see each other. And I also make sure that everybody's got really good sounds so that we're hearing it, like we're hearing what it should sound like. And not to mention, sometimes, you get the parts that you need. And in this case, we ended up keeping a lot of the stuff that we tracked at Echo Mountain. Because it doesn't matter how good of a sound you get, if the vibe isn't there, it just doesn't matter. I also try to spend a lot of time talking to the band and making sure we're getting the right takes and making sure that they're hearing the playbacks before we move on because often people will hear something in the playbacks that they're not noticing while they're tracking. Lots of communication. I mean, so that was, <clears throat> that was six. Do you want to hear? I definitely, I mean, if you, if you want, we can check out a couple other ones, but I mean, I do feel. Lots of communication. All right, this is the band house for Echo Mountain. And this is where I've stayed when I've recorded before and on this trip. So. Beautiful little house in a nice section of Asheville. We got bedrooms. Now somebody's still sleeping in there. This was my room. There's a whole upstairs section, really nice kitchen. And then this sunroom back here. <laughs> oh, you wound it up in reverse. Oh, you're trying to summon a demon, Billy. Oh my God. <laughs> Don't play that backwards. Yeah, yeah that. stop it. Now, thing that's interesting about this house is that it makes weird sounds. Like when you're sitting here, you'll think that somebody is walking on the roof or there's like some creature climbing on your ceiling or something. It's, it's very strange. The house just makes weird sounds. And I, I noticed that last time I was here. But what I was told is that these sounds actually have influenced some of the records being made at the studio. In fact, uh, Band of Horses song, uh, is There a Ghost was recorded at Echo Mountain and when Ben Bridwell was working on the lyrics for the song, the story I heard was that he was sitting in this house and hearing those sounds. So you should go listen to that song and check it out because it'll, it all kind of makes sense. I remember when I first heard that song, I thought, oh, that's kind of cool and creepy. And then when I heard that story about this house and that he was in this house and he was writing that song, I thought, oh, that all kind of makes sense. Well, anyway, 
I gotta head to the studio and get back to work. But first, I needed to take a little stroll. I love this town. We decided we might as well take advantage of some of the cool gear at the studio. For instance, this Leslie cabinet, which is usually used for organ, we ran Cody's guitar through it. These are Unidyne microphones. We also made use of this Dan Electro baritone guitar. This RCA ribbon mic for guitar room mics. I did find out where the secret door went. This is Kenny's studio where he was using Melodyne on some of our vocal tracks. I loved using these Neumann KM84s on acoustic guitar, and I think these might be the same ones I used on the String Dusters album I did up here years ago. But eventually, what seemed like endless days of recording finally came to an end, and it was time to leave Echo Mountain. So that was awesome. Thanks, I guys. I can't thank you enough, man. All right. Let's get the hell out of here. Hell yeah. Hey man, that was good. I ended up going down to Charleston to do more vocal and guitar overdubs at Soulshine Studios. I mean, you know, it was all right. And later had them come up here to the bunker to do more of that. Yeah, fucking sing. Come on, man. What the hell do you think you're doing in there? Damn, I didn't put you in the damn vocal booth. Come on. You're running your mouth, taking it from the rip. The things that you say, I have to come with. Shortly after that, I got the unfortunate news that their drummer, Alex Abraham, had taken his own life. It was um, really tough to hear. I'd gotten really close to everybody in that band, especially Alex. And I still finished the album. They're still going to put it out. I got all the mixes done. I'm not really going to go into all that in this video. I have some <laughs> footage and an interview I did with Alex. I it's a pig, for one thing. Dude, they're, they're pretty bad designs. If you're interested in learning more about this incredible human being, go and check it out. Thanks for watching.